Domestic violence is a major global issue, but it is the least discussed and the least addressed form of gender-based violence in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, a 2016 study done by the World Bank shows 51% of African women reported that being beaten by their husbands is justified if they either go without permission, neglect the children, argue back, refuse to have sex, or burn the food. Hello everyone and welcome to Our Voices. I'm Semenyu Shekoye and I'm joined by my co-hosts Orian Itangishaka and Jini Niwa. Today we'll be talking about the grave and pervasive issue of domestic violence in Africa and efforts underway to break the cycle. Hello ladies. Hello, hello. Hey Sadly, I feel like we know at least one woman close to us who went through domestic violence and this can be physical assault, psychological abuse, belittling, humiliation and even forced sexual intercourse. So do you know anyone? Have you come across one? Definitely. And it hurts my heart when I think about her situation, uh, a friend of mine. I mean, this was really bad because number one, she was in a country where she depends on him for papers, for legal papers, depended on him for financial resources basically depended everything on him. So in that kind of situation, uh, it's hard for a woman to just up and leave. Uh, number one, she doesn't know where am I gonna leave to go to. She doesn't know the resources in this country and all those things. So it's very difficult to even understand the situation that she's in because she, she seems as not able to even leave, even if she wanted to. Mm, yeah. 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 Well, I am that woman close to you. I've experienced it. And um, I think the reason why, and it's, and you still, you know, try to understand even years later. But in my case, it was one, a big one was the awareness. You don't even know it's um, abuse mm -hmm. because it's verbal. You're very aware, you know, as a human being, okay, if somebody, you know, you know, beats you up, beats you, up yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's bad. Mm -hmm. But when it's verbal, even culturally, it's hard to say, hey, this is wrong, because culturally, you know, in African family, whatever, you know, if your husband or the father of your children do something, well, you know, he's the father of your children. So you always have that in the back of your mind, he's the father of your children. And it's so gradual that when those red flags happen, it's, it's you hard barely to... barely notice it. Yeah, you can barely notice them. Mm -hmm. So there was the verbal abuse, like you say in your case, the financial. Mm -hmm. You know, when he told me, hey, you should stop working, I actually thought it was a good thing. It's wow. cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cute. It's mm -hmm. nice. He's a he man. He wants to take care of me. Mm -hmm. He wants to take care of me. And, but so, you know, little by little, you become dependent. You have mm -hmm. to ask. And of course, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a game where, you know, you're being called names, you're being lazy and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's so, so many things. And also myself, how come, you know, why did I make this choice? Mm -hmm. You know, I you, was- you, you start blaming yourself. Yeah, and yeah. even that, I even thought years later, because I was a college graduate, that I make smart choices. Mm. So, you know, how can he be bad, you know? Mm. So there's so many things that goes to your mind until <sighs> the violence was in front of my children and I say, okay, crazy, you need to go. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I share your point that assuming physical assault is the only way of, you know, domestic violence, it's very common among a lot of women. A lot, I know a lot of uh, friends who live with a lot of belittling verbal abuse and, you know, humiliation, thinking that, you know, he's uh, the father of my children. Mm -hmm. He's someone who loves me. Yeah. Uh, despite yeah. of ill, he still, you know, care about me. Mm -hmm. And also, as you said, cultural, religious reasons. A lot of women, um, you know, live even through physical abuses and sometimes even for lack of protection, legal oh. protection, or not knowing that there is a possibility you can get help outside your and, home. And I just want to add something. You said a good point, you know, the love. If you chose this man, that means that at them. some point, not only you love him, but he show you love. So you always think that that person he can is going to come back. come back to where Yes, yeah. because you yeah. show you a nice, you know, mm. image of him. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. And this is what uh, we'll be talking about today. In December 1998, when a Kenyan police officer beat his wife two days for not preparing meat for his dinner, it sparked a nationwide protest and demonstration that led to the passing of a family protection bill criminalizing wife beating and other forms of domestic violence. Domestic violence is a type of gender-based violence that takes place in an intimate or family relationship and can also be referred to as intimate partner violence. 
According to the United Nations, most violence against women is perpetrated by intimate partners or close family relationships. But despite adoption of international treaties and instruments to better protect women against gender-based violence, United Nations reported last year that almost one in three women continue to be subjected to physical and or sexual intimate partner violence at least once in their lives. On this week's edition of Our Voices, we will discuss whether existing laws on violence against women are effective enough to criminalize forms of domestic violence in sub-Saharan Africa. We will also explore what more can be done to break the cycle of violence against women and girls. Well, let's go to Nigeria, where the country is a signatory of several international treaties aiming to end sexual and gender-based violence against women. However, the problem persists. Now, some want uh, new laws to hold offenders accountable. Timothy Obwezo has this report from Job's Plateau State in Nigeria. Inside these walls in central Nigeria's Plateau State are women seeking refuge from sexual violence. Stella Kenef was raped by her father in 2017 when she was 10 years old. My father started touching my body and one day, he, he called me aside after our devotion and he said, I'm trying to teach you what life is so no guy will come and deceive you. I love you. I was scared that if I tell it out, my father is going to beat me and I'll stop paying my school fees. The abuse continued until last year when Kenneth told a family friend what was happening and they reported it to the authorities who arrested her father. She says the experience impacted her self-esteem. When I came, I was not friendly. I was kind of rugged. Not like, I mean, what I mean rugged, not to that kind of socialize. Always kind of be like a bad person, like bad girl. The non-profit Christian Women for Excellence and Empowerment in Nigerian Society launched in 2010 and says the safe house is helping many survivors of sexual violence like Kenneth cope with the trauma. Violence against women and girls is on the rise more than 20 years after Nigeria signed the Maputo Protocol, an African charter on women's rights. Recently, the French ambassador to Nigeria, Emmanuel Bledman, said Economic challenges in the country are driving the increase in the number of cases of gender-based violence. 18-year-old Kacholam Musa says she was raped by her uncle eight years ago. She says she's still afraid to report the case to her family. I lied and I told them that someone wanted to kidnap me. So after then I get it. I was afraid to report the case. In December, Nigerian lawmakers called for a review of the laws to enable enforcement agents to take decisive measures. Janet Beatrice, the safe house manager at Plato, is all for a review of current laws. For me, I think either life imprisonment or death sentence can even serve as a detriment to others out there because the gravity of this offense is a lifetime memory that has been created in the heart and in the life of the victim. Beatrice says harsher laws and stronger enforcement could act as a deterrent and help women here feel safe. Timothy Obiezu, VOA News, Joss, Plateau State, Nigeria. Well, before we get deeper into how legal frameworks are protecting women from domestic violence, Let's try to understand the serious consequences of domestic violence on women's mental and physical health. With us in the studio is Mildred Muhammad, domestic violence survivor and an award-winning global advocate. Muhammad was married to the DC sniper John Allen Muhammad and divorced him in the year 2000 prior to him carrying out the DC sniper attack of October 20, 2002 that killed 10 people. Later. John sought to kill his ex-wife and gain custody of their children. Ms. Mohammed is now international expert speaker for the U.S. Department of State and certified consultant with the U.S. Department of Justice Office for Victim of Crime. She also published a number of books and memoirs, including In the Mirrors of Chaos, Home is the Most Dangerous Place to Be. 
Ms. Mohamed, thank you so much for joining us and it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry, I'll, I will have to take you back a little bit to what happened. How did the abuse start? What were the signs or the red flags that he was an abusive husband? Well, it all started when he came back from Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And many military, when they go to a war, they come back, they're not the same. And that, that is what happened with him. So it's not always what are the signs, because you're asking mm -hmm. victims to uh, diagnose what this other person is doing to them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the signs are whatever you feel that they are, because everyone's level of tolerance is different. Everyone's level of pain is different. Everyone is brought up in a different home environment. So some people grow up with abuse in their home. Mm -hmm. So if you experience abuse in your relationship, it's, it's nothing mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. How right? long have you been married to him? And I was t for 12 years. 12 years. We have three children. Mm -hmm. And so once the abuse started, we had our own business. He had gotten out of the military, we had our own business and he was having affairs. Mm -hmm. And I told him I wanted a divorce. He moved out, but he still had a key to the house. So he would come in in the middle of the night mm -hmm. while I'm sleeping, but I opened my eye to a slither to watch him walk into the room, go from one side of the bed to the other, lean over to listen to me breathe, oh. and then leave out. Oh boy. That wow. must have been terrifying. It was. So you I had the locks changed. Mm -hmm. I had my, he changed my phone number without my permission. Mm. He had, we I finally went to court got the restraining order, but we still had visitation with the children. So he had them on a weekend visitation and he didn't bring them back. So it was mm. 18 months before I saw them again. Wow, mm. and you see the children, it's a difficult situation when children are involved. It is. How did it affect them? And for you, what was the turning point to say, I'm out? Well, the turning point to say I'm out is when he said, you have become my enemy and as my enemy, I will kill you. Oh. And after that is when he took the children on a weekend visitation and didn't bring them back. Okay. They were gone for 18 months. Couldn't get any help because we didn't have a solidified custody issue. Mm -hmm. It was that window opportunity between yes. going to court and, re and establishing custody. Sort of a he took the, Correct. Were there any moments where you felt like your life was really threat, you know, threatened? Oh, oh, as soon as he said that? Oh, yeah, my life yeah. was, I knew you, that. You he, was a, he was an 84 combat engineer. He mm -hmm. knew he was a hand-to-hand -hand expert combat. He was an expert shot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I knew because his motto was one shot, one kill, kill. to the head, uh -huh. never leave an enemy behind. He already <sighs> said I was his enemy. I was, he was going to kill me. Mm. The so, problem was I couldn't get anybody to believe me mm. because he was in the community. People knew him. They didn't know me because I was always at home. Okay. He was the one bringing the money home, like you mm -hmm. said. So financially, I was dependent upon him. So when I tried to get help, he told me, he said, I'm going to fix it to where no one will believe anything you say about me. And that's exactly what happened. I went to tell people, which I call the test, the touch test where you going out and I say, you know, John is really treating me really bad. He's talking to me like, mm -hmm. and he said, well, he wouldn't do that. You automatically it's took the side of the abuser. Yeah. That's how fast it works. As soon as I talk to you and you mm -hmm. say, well, John wouldn't do that. You took his side. Now you're going to go back and tell him mm -hmm. now I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, hearing her story briefly, mm -hmm. what, what is your assessment of how she went through it and what was going on in her situation? Well, it was never your fault. Mm -hmm. You didn't choose him. He chose you. Mm -hmm. Because you were a graduate, you didn't have much experience. And so he made it appear that you chose him. So once you stopped working, that was another way to isolate you from being able to use your own finances to leave. So when you say, well, I chose him and, you know, I thought I was smart. You are smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. If he would have told you, hey, you know what I'm going to do is I want to be in a relationship with you. I'm going to verbally abuse you. I'm going to take away your finances. I'm going to make it difficult for you to survive. Would you have chosen? No. Exactly. No. Yeah. But yeah. So he lied. The, what you call it, the representative showed up first. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when he knew you were comfortable with him, then the real person came out. Yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. never your fault. Thank, Thank you. you.
We're here with Mildred Mohammed, domestic violence survivor and global advocate who is committed to help victims and survivors of domestic abuse and violence. It's now time for a break, but we'll continue our conversation on what more can be done to break the cycle of domestic violence against women. We also love to hear from you on social media platform. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And our handle is at VOA Africa. Use the hashtag VOA Our Voices. Stay with us. We'll be right back. times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. Welcome back. You are tuned into Our Voices and we are discussing the impact, the impact of domestic abuse on women and ways to protect them. While many African countries have made efforts to adapt laws criminalizing violence against women, challenges such as effective enforcement still continue. To learn more on how adoption of laws help solve the issue of violence and discuss ways to strengthen their effectiveness, we have invited Bilix Abdurashid Shebi, the Executive Director of Women Aware of Rights Initiative in Nigeria. This is an organization that works closely with survivors. The organization was established in, 2020, in 2018 to help victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Ms. Shebi is joining us from uh, Kaduna, Nigeria via Skype. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So, uh, uh, how does um, the, the different laws and treaties adopted by Nigeria, how are they protecting women? I saw that the Violence Against Persons Act that was adopted in 2015 made a difference, but um, how is that helping, uh, especially in protecting survivors? The Violence Against Persons Act is, um, is, help is very helpful now. It breaks down the levels of abuse and how it's uh, dealt with. So we have emotional abuse, we have financial abuse, domestic abuse, physical rape, uh, sodomy, unnatural offenses, and all that, all broken down into different uh, segments of it. And then it has also prescribed uh, what amounts to the offense and the punishment for such offense. And in Kaduna, it has been domesticated, so it makes it very easy to get a conviction against uh, perpetrators of this act for the survivors. So are women uh, aware of the legal framework and do they feel protected? Generally, uh, I would not say uh, a lot of women are aware, but the women in the urban area mostly are aware. However, because of uh, religious and social cultural backgrounds, you find women not being able to just speak up, even though they know they're just a phone call away from getting help. But you get women saying, oh, I don't want to lose my family. I don't want my in-laws to hate me. I have kids with this man. And if for any reason I report that this is happening to me or happening to any of my kids, my kids won't have a very bright future because their in-laws will judge them, judge me, and all that. So we don't get women coming out. So, but then uh, between 2020 and 
just in 2024, there has been a rise because we have been doing a lot of awareness against domestic violence. In fact, we did a campaign themed Don't Hit Me, Let's Talk. This campaign was to urge women to speak. They had a right to be heard without being uh, abused, you know. So this has gone a long way. And it was, it's not so difficult to prove to the authorities why you're doing this because you have the violence against persons pro prohibition laws, VAPP, uh, the acts already aiding uh, CBOs and CSOs like us to actually go into the street and do a lot of awareness. There isn't a month that we have done awareness and not gotten a rise of women that would come out to say, oh, I have been going through domestic abuses, right. either by in-laws or by the spouse, and then there hasn't got the major problem is usually, and why they wouldn't even want to go out is, what's next for me? Where do I go if lodging the something is taken and something let me, Shabby, let me interrupt you a little bit as we go first. I know that culture and religion are very strong on the continent in terms of this situation, but we'll come back to that. Before we continue uh, the conversation, let's listen to women from the continent. Uh, uh, our reporter, Daniel Tonga, talked to women in Lusaka, Zambia, and we have Sylvia Moyo, Cosmas Chilisha, and Hope Mukwinda, as well as Cosmas Ngwende in our Your Voice segment, and we'll come back to discuss that further. I think the main reason why domestic violence is too much in Africa is number one, because of poverty, two, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and um, just superiority of a certain gender. Society nowadays uh, looks at a woman who is divorced as somebody who is weak. So one will, be, one will want to, learn, to live in a relationship just to prove to the society that they are okay, whilst they are being beaten every time. And no one wants to voice out most of the time. Those who are in abusive relationships, they never want to come out of it because they think as if like when a man is beating you up, then he loves you more than anybody else. I think domestic violence happens in the sub-Saharan Africa due to Number one, a man always wanting to be more dominant than the woman. Um, it, com it comes with economic power most of the times, where a woman is less um, wealthy and, they, and the man is actually more dominant in terms of that, in, in that manner. So they end up beating a woman or abusing a woman because they are the ones that are providing. Men themselves need education and maybe we need to have a lot of counseling stations nowadays. And um, we need to we need to start targeting a lot of men. It also has to border with mental health. I think sometimes men feel to be strong and they can't attend counseling sessions. They feel that you will be less of a man if they attend these counseling sessions. One of the deadliest crimes ever committed are crimes of passion. Now the issue is that how do we stop it? So how do we stop it? Uh, there must be an understanding from a man where it is said that live with women according to knowledge in the sense that they are the weaker vessels. So why domestic violence is so prevalent? Most of the times it's because of patriarchal uh, structures, which is basically men having a upper hand in uh, homes and then also things to do with toxic masculinity as well. So we have a culture or norm that states that a man is the head of the house. Yes, it is. But then there are situations where we have situations where a man can do what he wants to the woman, especially if they're in a marriage setup. So the first thing is to strengthen uh, legal frameworks that uh, criminalize um, gender-based violence or domestic violence rather. We all have equal rights. We all have the right to say no to something that you're not uh, consenting to or consenting to. And that initially is usually deemed as the beginning of um, differences between people that are married. We need to talk about these things. We need more sensitization conversations around communities, especially where we come from. Our cultural and religious leaders um, being effective in helping in the situation of abuse in homes, especially towards women? Honestly, not really. 
because our have cases where we have had to involve uh, you know cultural leaders and religious leaders and the only thing they are going to tell you is that okay the the good book said you need to be patient so you need to stay in an abusive environment and I always have you know a backlash from people when I say no you don't have to stay there is nothing making you stay none of the books say that you have to stay in an in an abusive relationship so you have a right to choose to not be abused. So it's just wrong when uh, cultural and religious leaders come out. So we have a few of them that would come out and really speak up against it. But then, you know, everybody is concerned. And one thing they keep saying is the kids. What is going to happen to the kids? What's going to happen to your home? But then I always tell women that if for any reason you die as a result of abuse, you're going to be alone. So you need to speak up and do something about it. Yeah. Thank you That's so good. much. Thank you so much, Ms. Shebi. Just before we end quickly, mm -hmm. coming back to the legal framework, can harsher punishments like capital punishment deter domestic violence or abuse? Unfortunately, capital punishment only happens after the victim is killed. Mm -hmm. And so anything prior to that, no. Because the reason why John was given a death penalty wasn't because of what he did to me. It was because he killed mm. multiple people, although I was the intended target. Mm. They did not allow me to, to testify about the domestic violence or abuse that I had encountered, as well as him kidnapping the children. Mm -hmm. I only testified in the sentencing phase. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Unless the person is murdered, then yeah. that's when capital punishment Thank comes in. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. You. Well, this is where we end our show. We would like to thank Ms. Mildred Mohammed for joining us for this very insightful conversation. Be sure to watch our voices on VOA website at voaafrica.com or on our YouTube channel where you can catch up on the latest episodes and the world's top news stories. Last but not least, we thank the, our Voices editorial and production team. We will see you again next week with another exciting program. Be sure to continue the conversation on our social media platforms. Until then, thanks for watching. Good day.